Jeff Ogilvy survives Wingfoot. Now the moment Aaron Badley has waited. Curry Webb is the five-time Australian Open champion. Golf at its best by one of the best in golf, Peter Thompson. Stand in front of a crowd like this today and win the PGA Championship is pretty special. He's done it at last. Greg Norman. Gets his name on the Stonehaven Cup. Leash been to 11 under. And we've got a new leader, kids. Here it is. Adam Scott. A life changer. Coming up next, you have unrestricted access to golf across Australia and the world. Thanks to Golf Australia, we're going inside the ropes. Subscribe now on iTunes or your favourite podcast app or head to golf.org.au. G'day everybody, welcome to the show. It is Inside the Ropes, episode number 47. Lovely to be here on a very big week. Some serious controversies to deal with on the program this week. Uh, I'll get to the the author and master of the controversy in a moment. Not you, Martin Blake. You have been an absolute clean skin, as always. How are you? Good to see you, Andy. <laughs> and uh, look, it's a big week, isn't it? I'm going to sort of wear a big sort of uh, indentation in my couch this week watching. I noticed that the US Open coverage from Shinnecock Hills starts at, I think, 1.30 a.m. on Friday morning, our time. So 1.30, can we do that? It's a big weekend. There's I, a lot I'm of challenges. Give it a go. World Cup, of course, launching on Saturday night as well, uh, Australian time. So we're going to be tested for the next uh, couple of weeks, uh, variously. Very point. much so. Indeed. Um, Simon McDulski, the Director of Rules and Handicapping Golf Australia, is going to join us in the middle segment of the show to try and just smooth out what has been an international golfing firestorm. Uh, the the torch, the, the match, of course, was thrown on to that uh, tinderbox by our very own Mike Clayton, who joins on the show. How are you? You all right? Are you calm? I'm all, you calm? I'm all good. I'm very calm. Up. Yeah, not too fired up. I mean, this is backstopping is an interesting, not the not the biggest issue in the game. The ball's much more. I mean, doing something with a ball is much more interesting than, or much more important than worrying about backstopping. You know, professional players just trying to help each other out. But it was interesting how that I just put it one tweet up there and it went crazy. Really. Well, we'll get, we'll we'll really get stuck into it when Simon joins us um, shortly. But were you have you been surprised by this, Clay? Just think before we you know sort of get really into it in a moment. Have you been surprised by the level of um, animosity that's come back to you from those who think that this is actually an acceptable thing to do? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, it was <clears throat> excuse me. It never would have taken off if I think Jimmy Walker's wife went in first and said something, and I kind of. We had a little back and forth, and then Jimmy jumped in to defend her, and you know he, I, I thought the, I thought he said some incredibly, made some incredibly silly admissions that he didn't need to make that suggested that he didn't understand the rules. But um, yeah, lo- lots of people who I don't think really understand the issue weighed in with some pretty silly comments. But what was heartening was Curtis Strange and yeah. Lee Westwood and Luke Don, guys, who, Zach Blair, guys who know the game, jumped in and said. You know, clearly there's, there are two ways to view this. And in our opinion, we think that what's going on is ridiculous and it needs to stop. So don't spend another penny on it now and don't go anywhere because we'll flesh this out, as I said, with a man who understands the rules of golf far better than certainly you and I do, Blakey, um, after the first break. You did mention US Open Week. It's major week, which is for you know, the men's game, which is always enormously exciting. We get to a US Open, which brings with it its own uh, unique styles and challenges. We're enormously looking forward to this, aren't we? Shinnecock Hills and the US Open. Yeah, well, look, for, for a start, it's a great venue, uh, Shinnecock Hills. I haven't been there, but it, you know, everyone says that it's a, an iconic uh, venue. The US Open has has its own character, hasn't it? It's, it's a battle for the players, although... I'll I'll read you some stats in a minute that that show that it has been changing a bit, and I think Kepka, Brooks Kepka last year shot, I think sixteen under, yeah, sixteen under at Aaron Hills. So whether it's been changing a bit, but normally it's uh, it's a battle for the players, oh. and it's based around you know shooting par. It's not necessarily a birdie fest, but I think that uh, you know it's different to some of the other majors, and I really like it. Clearly, they don't want anyone shooting six. Based on what we've seen, so for little snippets of videos that have been released here and there from the speed of greens and um, the significance of the rough at certain parts of the course, the USGA doesn't want anyone shooting 16 under this week. Well, no, but 
Shinnecock Hill is firstly one of the great American golf courses. In in the conversation is the best course in the world, probably. Perhaps not. Yeah. Perhaps Have not you the been best there, course. Coach, by yeah, the way? I've been there a couple of times. Yeah. So perhaps not the best course in the world, but one of the. One what of makes the, it great? Great routing, great holes, just the normal things that make a golf course great. For those who haven't seen it yet, what 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 style of golf course? Well, is it? It, there are no trees on it, so there are beautiful, expansive views across the whole property. In fact, when they played the Open there in '86, there were trees on it. And subsequent to the 86 Open, that Raymond Floyd one, they took all the trees down, apart from a copse of trees left of the sixth green, which they weren't allowed to touch. So beautiful, expansive views across green fairways, brown fescue roughs, so a great contrast in colours, but a great piece of land and a great routing and a great piece of design. Why did they take the trees down? Because they were not a part of the golf and they blocked off some amazing views across the property. So... so so as the golf course opened up and, and you had longer, more expansive views across the golf course, the better it felt, the better it looked. And the, you know, I, mean, I love long views in golf. Yeah, yeah. We tend to close them off in Australia because people, some people love the isolation of being on a hole and not being able to see any other it's hole. True. It's like, why do you love that? I, mean, I, don't, <laughs> I don't get that at all. But, you know. Um, it's the fifth time at Shinnecock. And last time in 2004, Retief Hoosen or Retief, Wilson, as the South Africans call him, Retief Goosen won with 11 one putts in the last yeah, round. Of course, it was, it, was, it was virtually unplayable. They, they had to water, water greens in yeah, the middle of the round. Uh, the USGA was absolutely <laughs> hammered, so uh, they'll be, I guess they'll be mindful of that this time. But the greens are normally very fast. It's funny, Clates, I was reading about the, you know, Shinnecock's over 100 years old. Hmm. When it you know, when it was redesigned for the first time in, in the 1930s, um, the Greens used to run at about three or four, um, <laughs> yeah. allegedly. And now they run at, you know, they'll run at 12 or something. And they're very slopey as well. So yeah, uh, it, seven, can, it can be very tough if you get on the wrong part of the Green. Yeah, the seventh Greens, that, which, which was one of the Greens that caused the problems That's in 2004. Green. That's the Redan with a big tilt in it. But talking about low scores, in 2014, the average width fairway was 26 yards. So that's the USJ going crazy over narrow fairways lined with high rough, which is something I dislike intensely. 2018, they've narrowed the fairways. But the average width is now 41 yards. So Bill Pacor and Ben Crenshaw, the best architects in the world, went in after the 2004 Open and made a bunch of changes to the golf course, widened it out and got the rough back and restored the original fairway widths which the USJ have subsequently narrowed down to an average width of 41 yards. So 15 yards wider than it was in 2004. But of course, it's, I think it's longer. There's a second hole, a brutally long par three that's around 260 yards, yards yeah, I think. So, yeah, yeah. And, and uphill. So, so it's a long, difficult golf course and made more so by the wind. It's Many Australians would call it a Lynx course. It's not a Lynx course. It's, it's a course that looks like, for those who've played the National in Melbourne, it looks a lot like the the Moona course of the National, that sort of land, yeah, that sort of feel. Yeah, yeah. So it's an open kind of sand dune course, really. So Phil Mickelson discussed the challenge that the USGA USGA have when it comes to getting that unique kind of test that they want for their US Open and striking the right balance. Is what the veteran had to say. I think it's a very difficult job to find the line of testing the best players to the greatest degree and then making it carnival golf. I think it's a very fine line and uh, it's not a job I would want. And I know that um, the, um, the USGA is doing the best they can to find that line. And, and uh, a lot of times they do, and sometimes they, they cross over it, but it's not an easy job. So uh, it's easy to, for all of us to criticize the difficulty is when you dream of a championship as a child, whether it's U.S. Open or the Masters, whatever event, and you dream of winning these tournaments as a child, and you work uh, hours and hours, and you fly in day, days and days and do all this prep work, and then you are left to chance the outcome as opposed to skill, that's a problem. That, like, like that, that's the problem that I have with it. So it's interesting, you know, carnival golf, the whole no, the, the notion that it doesn't take much to go too far. To, to just tip over the edge in setting it up to be this tough, gruelling test that they like the US Open to be. He's clearly acknowledging the fact that it doesn't take much for them to just get it wrong pretty easily. 
I don't mind it. I, I just, uh, you know, we get used to watching the normal tour events where they, you know, they drive and pitch and, you know, spin the ball back. You know, it, it won't be like that at all. I mean, par should be a, a good score. Um, Clayt 16 under last year, four under the year before, five under the year before that, nine under the year before that. So uh, people are saying that it has changed a bit, that identity of the Which USA. I think a good thing. Well, Justin Rose shot Marion. What was he? Was he one over par? Maybe mm. Ogilvy was six five over five or five over when he won. Yeah. So I mean, they get pretty yawny, boring golf tournaments when everyone's narrow, just, guys are just hacking out of the rough. And mm. I mean, I think Augusta and the Open Championship have done the best of the majors in setting golf courses up to create a difficult test, but one that's interesting, but doesn't become just a guys hacking out of long grass all day. Is that what we're going to see here? Is there a bit? No, of I think the course is wide enough. That okay. I mean, a 40, 40 yard wide average with fairways, that's plenty of space to drive into. What are we seeing? Are there runoffs around greens? Yeah, are there's they... short grass around the greens. Okay. So again, I think we'll see golf reminiscent of what you see at Royal Melbourne on the sand belt. Short grass around the greens, the ball's running away. So you know, players not pitching the ball out of thick rough a foot off the green, which which was one way. Well, that was seen as the the, 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 the normal way the USJ would. Set up a golf course for the Open. Do we know but, what sort of weather we're going to get for this? Like, has there been any? I um, I, I actually did a podcast with a guy in New York a couple of nights ago, and he said it's gonna. He said low, high sixties, low seventies, overcast. So, so Melbourne summer weather really, but with a bit of wind around, yeah, like just wind enough and, wind around to. So there was a, you know? there was one. The first day in eighty six was a brutal day. I think Bob Tway shot seventy. Ray Floyd who won the tournament opened up with a 75 that he said could have been 82. Yeah. So I ground it out to us. It was a great score. It was, it, was as, it was as good a round as I could have hoped to score given how difficult the conditions were. So the, the weather cleaned itself up a little bit towards the end of the week. But that was one of the great opens in 86. They had, I think, one point there were seven guys tied for the lead on, on Sunday in the back nine. Payne Stewart, Trevino, Floyd, Norman, Kelkovec here was right in there. That, that was a great open. Lenny Watkins. Just on uh, Mickelson, Andy, uh, he was saying uh, that that short grass around the greens, he, he feels that it, it suits him because he can use his creativity and his chipping and his flops sure. and stuff like that. Whereas last time, well, he, he nearly won last time. Uh, he, he made a double on the 17th. Otherwise, he, he would have won it. And, and the, the heartbreak of Mickelson at the US Open, you know, subsequent to that, he lost to Jeff Ogilvy yeah. at wing foot. You know, he's I think he's run second three times or four times. So... Would he be the best story of the week, or would it be Tiger Woods winning, or an, or an Aussie well, winning? Twenty-six times he's teed it up, and it's been the, the the it's been the tournament full of despair, and still yeah. the one that he desperately wants more than any other. It could be a hell of a yarn. You can't believe that amongst Sam Snead, Phil Mickelson, and Arnold Palmer, between those three incredible players, they won one U.S. Open between them. Is that right? That's, I mean, it's a staggering statistic. <laughs> really, Andy is. North won too. Yeah. <laughs> And Which Arnold, is not to Arnold, denigrate any North. I mean, no, anyone, no, no, no. anyone who wins two years opens a hell of a player. Right. And Arnold Palmer threw one away, didn't he? Arnold Palmer threw a lot of them away. Yeah. Um, uh, there's nine Australians in the field, yeah. Andy. Uh, Adam Scott's an interesting one. Uh, he's announced, uh, well, he's turned up at Shinnecock with a new caddy. Uh, and it, well, he's, he didn't turn up with him. This guy, Lenny Bomolo, uh, is a local caddy. He's like the assistant caddy master at at Shinnecock, and he's using him as a local caddy because he's parted from David Clark, English guy who he's had for the last 18 months, and he's also gone back with his instructing to Brad Malone, his brother-in-law, who he parted from, I'm guessing, about two years ago. He's been doing some weird stuff. He was working with a guy called George Gankus, who you probably he heard pretty, of, um, Clates. He's pretty out there, George, yeah. George, he's yeah. got a reputation for being very left field. He started his business as really an, an internet instructor, but he's moved on a bit from that. So Adam's made some changes. That That's going to be interesting. Who would be the best Australian, Hope, do you think? I'm probably going to say Dale Leishman to be boring. That is pretty boring. Yeah. That's really boring. Well, Leishman, if it gets windy, you know, he's always good in the yeah, wind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Day has had a pretty good year. Yeah. Is there anyone else who might, well, I think, might bub well, up? Adam Scott. I mean, I mean, people forget that while he's taking a local caddy, a part of the U.S. Open for, for, for the longest time was you, you couldn't bring your own caddy. You had to use a local caddy. And Augusta as well. And Augusta. Augusta was the first white caddy at Augusta was to win was... Nick DePaul, caddy for Seve in 1983. So, so Augusta used, used in-house caddies until 1983. But, you know, the USGA and the club controlled the caddies. The players would turn up and 
There's your assigned caddy for the week, which was outrageous when you think about it. <laughs> well, well, Adam knows this guy, Andy. He, he's had him carry his bag for him before on previous visits to Shinnecock. So, and on one of those occasions in a practice round, I think he shot 63. Um, so he knows the guy. He's basically said to everyone at Shinnecock that this guy knows his way around the track and he's parted from his own caddy. So what's he going to do? Well, okay, I'll use this guy. It's probably his busiest stretch of golf that he's played for quite some time. I mean, he had last week off, but six weeks in a row prior to that, so desperate was he to get in. He, he didn't give him... That's a lot of golf. Like that's, you know, and he made the cut every week, so he's, playing four, he's played 24 rounds of golf in six weeks. I, I, th- I believe he's probably pro-am. played as much uh, to June this year as he, he did all, most of his he's recent gonna, He's in good... I mean, he's, he's, Which would be a good thing. I mean, I, I think there have been four players in the history of golf. I mean, this might, might not quite be right, but Jones, Hogan... Nicholas and Woods were the four guys who were great enough to play very, very limited schedules. Mm. Hogan in 53 played six tournaments, won five of them. Nicholas never played that much. Jones was a part-time player, really. Uh, and Tiger played the Hollywood schedule, but he was great enough. It didn't matter. But there have been a lot of guys who've played, I think, less golf than they should have played to stay in top. Nick, and I don't want to criticise Adam for not playing much because he's clearly married, two kids. He, he puts a lot of priority on being at home. Not for me to say, Adam, you don't play enough, but you know, I think he, you, you play your way into form, and I, I think he's a great chance this week. You know, you've got to drive the ball really well. He's, I think he's still got some great golf left to play, Adam Scott. I love the fact he's he's had kind of like for the first time I think ever he's had that kind of hungry hungry dog syndrome about him, which yeah. he's always been such a beautiful player, and things have come. Nothing comes easily, but mm. it's. Been, well, he hasn't missed a major since two thousand and one. That's right, mm. and he, he's kind of whatever he's got. He, he's worked his he's worked his bum off, obviously, but he's he's got what he's got pretty much on you know the great natural talent and his ability to harness that. But he's got into this field by just that's my bone, and I'm going to get it. I mean, he goes to qualify. He wasn't expecting to do that, so well, he, you, you know, know that, that's a, the first time. I don't. I'd suggest first time in his professional life that he's maybe since the very early days that he's had to work this hard for something, which I think is a great thing. I don't think – well, I'm sure he's worked hard, but, but – you, I mean, you know what I mean. Well, Adam, I mean, as an amateur, he got an invite to Morocco, finished fifth or sixth on the European tour. He got an invite to the Benson Hedges. If he finished – one of them he finished fifth, one of them he finished sixth. So he turned pro, he got some invites. He certainly easily made enough money to get a European tour card. Mm. And it's been easy plain sailing because he's such a great player. That's, that's what I'm it's, He's yeah. never had to grind for anything, really, until he had to finish in a two-way tie for ninth at Trinity Forest two weeks ago that's and right. finish in a three-way tie for ninth and missed by point one of a point. And now you're at the qualifying. And, you know, and, and Adam, getting in this US Open or not, he's not going to change Adam Scott's life unless he wins it. But you know he's got professional. Pro- but I think it's a great thing he's been for- he's been oh, forced agree. to play hard to get in. Totally agree. Um, anyone want to forecast a tip before we get it? We'll, we'll do all the Simon McDulski is about to join us. We're about to get into the big story of the week. But anyone want to proffer a I'll, tip before I'll we? S- I'll say Dustin Johnson on the back of last week, which we'll talk about a we bit will. more. But I'm going to say Dustin Johnson. You want to tip someone? Uh, well, he's, he's too easy. To, I mean, he's a great US Open player. Xander Shoffle. There's one out of nowhere. There is, there is one out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. yeah. Uh, Justin, I just keep, I just keep tipping Justin Rose to win, and he. Well, he's already rarely, won one, hasn't he? He just, he's always there or thereabouts. So. It's not like picking the winner of the French Open tennis, is it? Really, it's, kind of, <laughs> it's a bit easy. Yeah, it's I mean, a bit well. easy. We're going to break our way. Um, there has been a conversation take place in the global golf community which has split it right down the middle. And we're going to confront that on the other side of the break with the man who lit the fuse, Michael Clayton, who is here, ready to go. Hi, I'm Minji Lee, and I'm proud to be an ambassador for MyGolf, Australian Golf's National Junior Program. One of my favourite things about coming back to Australia is seeing all the kids getting into golf. My golf is every Aussie kid's first step on their golfing pathway. It's all about fun and friendship, learning golf and life skills in a safe and healthy environment. So, if your child is between 5 and 12 years old, be sure to find a program near you at mygolf.org.au. G'day, my name's Bob Shearer, the 1982 Australian Open champ. When you're listening on the radio, listen to the ropes for all the news and scoops coming up. 
Welcome back to the show. As mentioned in the opening segment, uh, we do have Blakey, the man who has arguably, well, has been in the centre of one of the biggest scandals and firestorms that golf... It's up there with Watergate. Well, I don't know where it sits. In in terms of all of golf's great um, sort of controversies, this sits... This sits right up there. I mean, the walk off at Vic, the square grooves with Ping. Oh, I don't know. This is like right up there. Can I, where am I with? He's this? describing himself as a bomb thrower. I think he, he's picked up what four hundred uh, Twitter followers, Clates. I have. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to be joined by Simon McDulski in a moment, who is going to give us the actual lowdown in terms of where this sits, in terms of the morality of the game v the rules of the game. But for those who have just, you know, who who have joined us unaware of what's taken place this week. Um, the backstopping issue has been something that has been a theme that has been threading through inside the ropes the last couple of years. We've seen examples of it that have not necessarily led to an issue because the ball hasn't collided with another ball, but we saw it this week and it set you off again. What what did you see that, that made you get fired up this week? Well, I just, I mean, I hate the concept of the, the, the way it's come into the game in, this generation and people say well you old bastards you know it was always better in your day but you know it's something that never happened when I play you know you never saw Jack Nichols or Curtis Strange or any of those it just never happened and it's crept into the game where players are leaving their golf ball around the hole while the other guy while the other player is playing in a sense as I see it helping their mates out and it's fine in match play and of course you you would always mark the ball in match play because you don't want to help your opponent but there's a thing called the responsibility to the field where there are 142 other guys who are playing who don't have the advantage of having a ball sitting a foot behind the hole that might stop your ball from, rather than running four feet past it, it, sh- it stops a foot away. So Ben Arn and John John Hart were playing at Memphis the other day and uh, John Hart chipped first and he chipped his ball within a foot of the hole. I was just watching it on TV. Yep, yep. Ben Arn, then the caddy pulls the pin out they leave the ball by the hole, clearly a foot behind the hole. So, and then Ben Arn chips his ball. There's plenty enough time for Arn to go uh, up. Plenty of enough time ball. to yep. walk up and yep. mark the ball. Yep. Yep. The ball didn't didn't hit, but it ran four feet past. They both made three. But I kind of just put it on my phone and taped it and stuck it on Twitter and said, "What a joke!" And it kind of went crazy from there. I mean, Jimmy Walker's wife, I think, got in first and started. Um, I, I've lost track of what she said, but then Jimmy Walker came in and said, well, you know. He said, well, usually a guy will ask if he would like to mark it. If you don't like a guy, you will mark it anyway. If you like the guy, you might leave it to help on a shot. Some guys don't want to give help at all and rush to mark their ball to each his own. This was it. I've, When I read that, I thought, this is not the last we'll hear of this. This is surely something that we will will create some sort of ripple effect around the world of golf and will be a matter of contention. Well, he's actually exposed the truth, hasn't he? He's, he's acknowledged that guys do this. And that's what, what we thought, wasn't it, Clates? Yeah, we, yeah, we've been bang on it for, for a couple of years. But, yeah, I mean, it's clear that there's been a change in the way players see this rule being administered. So last year at the US Open on the 55th hole of the US Open – sorry, not the 50 the, – it was the it was the Sunday of the final round. Yeah, the fifty fifth hole. Brian Harmon missed the second green at Aaron Hill's left. Justin Thomas, who I think was leading, hit over the green. So Harmon pitches the ball up to two feet behind the from where Thomas was playing, two feet behind the hole, and could easily have walked up and marked the ball. Just stood there, left the ball there, and Thomas pitched up, and the ball again. The balls didn't hit, but. And to me, it almost doesn't matter whether the balls are colliding no, or not. No. It's a mentality that thinks it's okay to help out the guy you're playing with at the expense of the field. So you're not going to see this in the Ryder Cup. They're all going to run the rush up and mark the ball. <laughs> so they hide behind the excuse of pace of play. And as Zach Blair came out on Twitter and said, Zach said, this pace of play thing is complete crap. It's got nothing to do with pace of play. It's helping your mates out. Yeah. And as Jimmy Walker said, well, I'll help out a guy I like, but I won't help a guy I don't like. I could, well, you, golf can't run like that. I could play. It's I don't outrageous. Know, but I was watching. Oh, when, he, when, that, when, when he said that, were you shocked when he said that? Well, I, well, I came on Twitter and said, so, so you decide who you help out and who you don't? Yeah. I mean, how can – golf can't – I mean, golf's a game that operates on integrity <laughs> – on people understanding not only the letter of the rules, but the principle of the rules. And clearly, you know, these 
come clowns come on Twitter and say, well, what are you going to do from 200 yards away? Well, of course you're not going to mark the ball from 200 yards away. But when you're 15 feet away, go mark your ball. Mm. <laughs> Eddie you know, Pepper. So it's Rule 22 <laughs> slash 1, Andy, says that you can't collude on this. It is a disqualification for both players if you do it. Well, let's and bring Simon Magdulski in here, Director of Rules and Handicapping Golf Australia, a friend to the pod, a man who's been in here many times before, Simon. It's a very opportune time now that Blakey's brought the rule out of the book and put it on the agenda that we bring in. Welcome to the show again. Murray, good to be back again. Uh, Clates, big week in golf yeah, well, this week. Yeah. Well, it's a, well, well, you know, it's a firestorm in our little, little world. No, but, I like it. Know. I love it because I think we're all better <clears throat> for, obviously, you know, people care and there's passion and... Um, yeah, there's two, this seems to have split people right down the middle. This is one of those great topics, and they're always the best topics, the ones that um, split people down the middle. But is there a rule that's been breached here? Because there's been some dispute as to whether or not this is a breach of the game's moral code or whether there's actually been a breach of the rules. Yeah, look, Blakey was just quoting Rule 22.1, which, you know, as he says, if you've got two players who actively agree to leave a, a ball in position to help um, a competitor in the field play the game, then uh, the penalty would be disqualification. The, the challenging thing here is to determine whether two players have actually actively agreed to leave that ball in position. In a lot of cases, um, it's there's a ball there and the other, the other player um might want it left there but they're not actually asking for it to be left there so it's it's difficult to actually demonstrate that there has been this clear agreement um jimmy walker he's talking about actually actively agreeing to do it and there's a conflict with the the rule there that that said i do think that there is a real problem with a lot of players in that they don't think they're breaking a rule they think what they're doing is acting in accordance with the etiquette of the game. They think that the expectation is that players should leave the ball there to help their fellow competitor. That, to me, clearly is what a lot of players think. I would never have thought that. Well, I, I would have thought if my ball's around the hole, I would have thought it was incumbent upon me to go and mark that ball. I mean, I mean, I, maybe I was weird, but when I played... I can say with hand on heart, I always, if I thought a ball was going to, I would tell the guy, go mark your ball. I've yeah. often done that. And, you know, when you say it splits people down the middle, it didn't split Curtis Strange or Zach nope. Blair or Lee Westwood or Luke Donald. Or Luke Donald Eddie all jumped Purple. in. No. So it, it's, it's the players, certainly the, the, the players aren't split on it. Well, oh, there's well, a couple so of young Players of the older generation, yeah. there are a couple of younger guys yep. who jumped in. Yep. Yep. But, you know, I mean, one guy came in and said, well, I did this my whole college career. Well, it doesn't make it right. <laughs> but, you know, Curtis Strange, who I think is the, the strongest voice in all this, absolutely came down the side. He said, this is rubbish, this yeah. stuff. You know. So Let me read we... out the rule, Andy. In stroke play, if the committee determines that competitors have agreed not to lift a ball that might assist any competitor, they are disqualified. I'm just wondering, Simon, whether you've ever heard of has, has there been an instance you've ever heard of where anyone was disqualified for that? In a no, I, in a big amateur tournament. I, in a I, I don't believe in any major event that a player has been disqualified. There, in addition to the rule itself, there is a decision that talks about capacity for a referee to jump in if they think there's not an active agreement, but that a ball should be lifted. And if a referee comes in and says, you know, whether or not you guys have actually actively agreed to lift that ball, or sorry, to leave that ball there. I don't care that there's no active agreement. You still need to lift the ball. And then if the players leave the ball there in that situation, the rule, the decision um, clearly says that there, there should be a disqualification applied. Well, this goes to intent, doesn't it? I mean, intent is such a difficult thing to prosecute in the world of sport often. But when you get a situation where players are leaving balls behind holes and you've got Jimmy Walker saying... If you like the guy, you might leave it there to help on a shot. I mean, this is now publicly stated. He can't take that away. He has said that. So Jimmy Walker now can never leave a ball behind a hole again, ever. If he's playing with a couple of his Ryder Cup, Cup teammates on a, in a PGA Tour event or somewhere else around the world, if he leaves a ball behind the hole, he's on the public record via his tweet suggesting, oh, I'll leave the ball there to help out a mate. 
I mean, you can't be doing that. Yeah, look, I, I would make the point that this is not just about Jimmy Walker. No, no, a, no, lo- a lot of other players have done this. Um, there are some pretty um, high-profile superstars of the game who do this. And in in my book, I don't believe they're trying to cheat is one of the words that's been bandied around. As I said before, I think that they believe they're doing the right thing, that the etiquette of the game yep. has changed amongst these top players and there is a significant proportion of them that think the right thing to do is to leave the ball there. And if they don't leave the ball there they will look poorly for it amongst their peers. And I think that's a problem. It's like not taking your hat off when you shake a bloke's hand. Andy, I'll, uh, we'd urge uh, all our listeners to have a look at Twitter, you know, the Twitter feed of Mike Clayton and they'll see all this stuff. But it's also been picked up on all the websites in the States. And I think we've got a little grab of Jimmy Walker himself speaking about it, haven't we? Well, that's just it. I think we see a video online and we don't know what happened in that circumstance. There's no audio that that said what was going on. I don't know the conversation between those guys. I know if I saw that video and I was the guy chipping, I'd want that ball gone. I'd want it marked or tapped in because that's a shot right there. I think I'm trying to chip in. I don't see how there was any malicious intent on either players part there which is what everybody seems to be talking about and then somehow pace of play got dragged into it and that's what kind of set me off a little bit but um the whole marking the ball deal i mean i i it happens all the time where you chip you pitch a ball up on the green and you ask the person that's coming next if they're pitching you know he said you want me to go mark that it just that's just the way it is it happens and a lot of times you leave it in the other player's hand you want the ball marked sometimes you you know, there's, there is, uh, I think you can, I don't know, I, I've always asked, do you want it marked? I give that person the option, because sometimes uh, I just think that's just the way it is. I think that's, I was just trying to shed some light on how it actually happens out here and what actually happens. Uh, that's it. So do you buy what Jimmy Walker's saying? Have you got to... You know, does that sound convincing to you? His motives and reasons I, for it. I'm pretty sure he didn't know the rule. That's what I. What so I what think do, clats, what, you, yeah. you? Well, yeah. it's, it's some. I mean, I never knew there was a rule 21. I just played by what I thought was the right thing to do. And my generation, I think, all played by the same rules. We all. No one. I never saw a guy. It was just wasn't a part of the tour when I played. I'm pretty sure that. And, you know, certainly my memory of it. But um, the question to you: How many guys do you think even know the rule exists? I, th- I think very few players yeah. know what the, looks like. the subtleties of the rule. Mm. Um, and, you know, people like me or you can talk about this in the public domain, but at the end of the day, for the players, what really matters is how the referees on their tour will interpret the rule. That's that's the key. Um, and, I, you know, I think they need a communication from their, um, from their tour you, officials. You would think after this, I mean, I'm not sure, I guess it's reasonably public now, but... At some point, someone on the PJ Tour has to say to the players, here's how we're going to be handling this. We can't let this go on because it's such a bad look for the game. I mean, I mean, I mean, I think to this point, they've just tried to ignore it and pretend it doesn't happen. But And people say it doesn't matter, but there's a case, Tony Finau last year, I think at the Safeway tournament, plugged ball in the bunker at the 12th hole, hits it out, there's a, and there's a backstopping ball of foot behind the hole, he hits it out of the bunker. The ball's going 40 feet past the hole, hits yeah. the other ball, stops by the hole, taps in. Finishes second on his own and costs Chess and Hadley and Phil Mickelson each at $100,000. So people say it doesn't matter. Well, actually, in that case, it certainly matters. But rules, but rules are there because <laughs> one in a thousand players will look to cheat. Like 999 blokes would, well, or women would never think to cheat or do the wrong thing. I don't think anyone's cheating. No, no, no. But I use the word <laughs> cheat just because yeah. to explain why rules are there. But th- even if this only happens once every thousand times, it shouldn't matter. No, the, this rule is about establishing what's fair. Yeah. And and what I think some of these players are forgetting is that if a ball hits another ball that's used as a backstop, that helps one player, but it hurts another player potentially. If one player moves up the leaderboard, that's at the expense of a, another player. Mm. There could be someone who misses the cut, who loses their tour cut as a result. Mm. They might miss out on a playoff. As a result, Andy, it's, it's quite a, a serious issue, obviously. But one, there was one tw- particular tweet from Jimmy Walker in amongst all that that uh, oh, really amused me, and it, it basically was a reply to uh, esteemed Mike Clayton, which said, "Golf is hard, dude. 
try it out. <laughs> he clearly had no idea that who I mean, Clates was. What did you, what what did you think when you saw that? Well, I, mean, I don't expect Jimmy Walker to know no, I am. No. But, uh, but, but I said, well, I did. I played the European and the Australian Tour for 20 years. But yeah. then he came back with a really condescending thing, which was – the, the, the good, next one good was for you, kind of, I think, wasn't it? Good yeah, for well, you. good for you. Isn't it? Well, yeah, mm. what he should have come back and said, well, well I didn't realise, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you've yeah. got European, I've got mine. Yeah. That, that yeah. was fine. Mm. But he was, it was a kind of condescending reply to the fact that, well, I actually played for 20 years, mate. I kind of know a little bit what, what, what I'm talking about. <laughs> like yeah. Danny Pepperell. Golf is hard, it, dude. You should try it. <laughs> it went on. It was out of line. He was out of line and he let himself down. But, so Jimmy Walker went on and he said, I try to help everyone, especially if they got a bad break or got short-sighted. I've asked, do you want me to leave the ball? To which Eddie Pepperell wrote back, and I do love Eddie Pepperell, and I encourage everyone to follow Eddie Pepperell. Eddie Pepperell said, I also do the same as Jimmy. I sometimes take it further. I ask them if they've ever experienced real adversity in their lives. If they have, I pop a few T's in the ground as well to act as another potential backstop. <laughs> Being nice feeds the soul. Uh, he he just has a way yeah. of Eddie, yeah. Eddie Pepperell. And so, Simon, before we let you go, is this the sort of thing that will uh, lead to people in your position and elsewhere around the world to perhaps send out a memo to all all golfers that maybe you just need to be aware of this? It isn't necessarily to be encouraged, or what sort of language, what sort of action or language would be ta- would be used following on from all of this? If I'm a tour player, I want to know how my tour officials are going to interpret the rule. There is some grey in this. Um, there needs to be this active agreement. Um, it does depend on how close the two players are to the hole. You know, Clates talked about being 80 yards away. You know, no one's expecting players to go up and mark balls that are 80 yards away. Uh, 80 yards away. But, but how close do you need to be? You, you need guidance on these sort of things from yeah. the tour officials. So to me, it really comes down to the, the tours, the big tours, um, communicating with their players and letting them know what the expectations are. But, but addressing this culture that um, has emerged in the game where the players, as I said before, the, the, there are a, a significant proportion of players, I believe, who think they are doing the right thing here and they think they will look poorly amongst their, their peers if they start marking balls and lifting them and not helping out. And that needs to be corrected. What do you think should happen? Why the tour need to say, say something. Issue some sort of communicator to the players that says that this is not acceptable behaviour. You know, I mean, stop backstopping. Yep. And, and clearly, you can't... You know, there were guys on Twitter coming and saying, well, what are you going to do? You know, some guy hit, hits it stiff from 200 yards away, walk up. Well, of course not. I mean, you're completely missing the point. But there have been a bunch of instances. I mean, I, there was one last year where Jordan Spieth chipped up from the edge of the green. The guy he was playing with, he left his ball there, right in an advantageous position. Another guy chipped up. Jordan Spieth was off practicing. He's playing on the side of the green while the other guy was chipping. Uh. Jordan, go mark the ball. Uh. I, mean, I mean, you know, it's just, but, yeah, I mean, it's, the problem is it's a silent collusion. No one says anything, but everyone knows what they're doing, I think. And you can't, I'm not sure any, any right-thinking player can think it's okay. No one else in the history of the game has ever thought it was okay. You didn't see Bobby Jones doing it or Ben Hogan or, no one was doing it. So, but it's just this cultural thing that's inhabited American pro golf more than European probably. But, you know, it, it's, it, it's not... It's not the actual act that bothers me. It's the mentality yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Know, that thinks that it's sure. okay that yep. I don't care about the other 142 guys. I'm going to help my mate out. Well, yep. that's just – golf's never operated like that, and it can't operate like that, I don't think. Clay, so I would say, though, that you know, a change in etiquette of the game, can there be something that suddenly jumps in? You and I have spoken before about through lines – um, early in your career, no one was concerned about yeah. walking on through. Greg lines. Norman introduced and that, then, in and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, that just a switch was flipped because of Greg Norman, yeah. and now no one walks on a through line, and that's another thing that. So, you know, so is that a good thing or a bad thing, or just being really pretentious? I mean, Peter so, Thompson. But you know, if you spoke to Peter Thompson about a through line, what the hell is a through line? <laughs> For those who don't know what a through line is, if you put. If a player's going to tap a ball in from behind, from behind the hole from where you're playing and you might hit a 30-foot putt that's potentially going to run past the hole and then have to putt back through the other player's footprints, I, I think that it depends on the surface of the green. It depends on mm. – I mean, Brad Faxon never worried about it. He said, well, I'm, I'm planning on holding my putt, mate. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 the and, problem here, and the problem here is that it unnecessarily wastes a lot of time it does, yeah. and, and damages the um, the product that people watch when they go to the golf. But it's a different situation from backstopping because no. it's not, st- not 
you know, it's not affecting anyone else's no, but, play. But, it's not but costing my, anybody a shot. My, or, yeah, my point is that cultures can change in absolutely. an instant. And I think yeah. that is what's happened here. Yeah. It used to be a problem, but it has become a problem. And, and the players, again, I, I think that they believe they're doing the right thing. And it needs to be explained to them what the downside is. It's staggering to think that they're doing. They think they're doing the right thing. I mean, how can they possibly no. think that? Yeah, you know, I mean, you would have to be pretty silly to think that you you weren't dis. It's not a very long boat to draw to think that you're doing the right thing to wondering. Well, what, how is this affecting the other 142 guys? Or how would you feel if you were sitting in the clubhouse, you know, tied to the lead, and some guy chips up and rather than having a six foot putt to beat you he's got a one foot putt to beat you because his mates left the ball by the hole you know you know that's not a very hard no, very long boat to draw to figure simple, out how, how this stuff's going to play out yeah i would have thought so. no well, in the storm that you created over the weekend yeah. there was one of the high profile players who was saying look i i used to have a problem with this but i've recently come across to the other side mm-hmm. i've had a chat to people like johnny miller and oh, zach my blair, father, yeah, zach absolutely, blair. yeah yeah and so zach blair's gone from one side of the debate to yeah. the complete other side and he hadn't thought of yeah. the problems it could be causing mm-hmm. the rest of the field you explain that um and we move on yeah we will watch this space with a great deal of interest i look forward to your next um um, volley that you throw into the golfing community, Clates. Next time you're coming on the show, make sure you do likewise and give us something to talk about. I will, mate. Thank you. Good man. Uh, you're sticking around. Simon, thanks for coming on and having a chat to us. I think everybody who plays the game, driving to a golf course right now, uh, listening to the podcast will be enlightened. And I tip in the blokes around golf course all over Australia. This morning, or women for that matter, will be marking their ball if it's within that kind of couple of feet around a hole somewhere. I think they'll all be doing it. Uh, you would hope so. I hope so. Thanks for coming on. So I'm Madulski, the Director of Rules and Handicapping at Golf Australia. Back to wrap everything up on the other side of the break here on Inside the Ropes. Hi, this is Sherelle McMahon. Swing Fit is the fun, healthy, social way for women to get started in golf. You'll learn the basics of the golf swing and how to putt over a six-week program and get your whole body moving through yoga yoga and Pilates style exercises. You don't need any golf knowledge or equipment. Simply turn up in comfy clothing and get started. You'll be surrounded by like-minded people and receive constant support. So get outdoors, meet new friends and learn a sport that you can play for the rest of your life. To find a program near you, visit swingfit.com.au. G'day guys, it's Brian Russell here and I'm a long way from home playing on the Latin America tour and living in the US but I keep up with all my Australian golf while listening inside the road. Welcome back to the show. Um, at the end of all of that, Blakey, you've heard Simon, you've heard Clayt. Um, will there be, you would having you understand the machinations of the way sport works and sporting, organis- sporting organisations work, you'd be expecting, would you be expecting something to be yeah. Issue to remind players of what they should be doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, oh, I, I think that that it'll have a, an impact just because it's it's been bubbling already. It was bubbling before this. Mm. Now it's come right to the surface, and uh, I think it's time for the tours to, as as Simon said, it's time for them to to speak up and and say that it's wrong. Okay, let's wrap up the show. We'll go around the world and have a look at how the Australians have fared on the major tours, particularly leading in to the US Open. I'll ask you a question: Is Dustin Johnson an actual cyborg, is he is he devoid of any human emotion whatsoever? Well, you're talking about his hole out for eagle with a nine iron on the very last hole. Did you see the way the he responded to it? Nothing. Yeah, nothing. The crowd was going ballistic too. Nothing. Like his heart rate didn't even didn't even peak by a beat. He's pretty cool, Dustin Johnson. He's a pretty cool. Just player. like yeah. he's too cool. Mm, no, he's. Well, like get a bit good. excited about that. Um, we we don't have Golf Channel here. But um, there's a guy called. Do you know Dr. Gio Valienti? Does that name Valienti? No. Does that? No. He's, apparently, he's a mind coach. He's one of those guys who gets into the head of. You, you, I mean, you're. I know you're a big fan of these kinds yeah, of guys. Yeah, you tell people how to coaches, think yeah, and all that sort of stuff. Of well, he offered um, an observation about Dustin Johnson after he um, holed out with that eagle to win the St. Jude by plenty. This is what uh, Dr. Gio Valianti had to say. It's what you and I were talking about earlier, Charlie. It's the idea of caveman golf. Sea ball. Hit ball, pick ball up, lather, rinse, repeat. He, he, he actualizes playing the game 
in the way that every sports psychologist wishes their clients would play the game. I mean, I've never had a golfer in 20 years, never had a golfer call me and say, hey, doc, I'm keeping the game too simple. Can you help me with that? It's, mm. It never happens. It's always I'm overcomplicating it. It's always I'm overthinking. It's always I have too many thoughts. So on some level, he's sort of the living exemplar of how you want golfers to be on the golf course. So caveman golf uncomplicates the whole thing, uh, does Dustin Johnson, according to our good doctor from the Golf Channel. Does that kind of make sense to you? It does. I'm a, I think he's done a remarkable job of coming back from adversity better than most players would have in terms of he lost that PGA at Whistling Straits because he grounded his club in what he didn't realise was a bunker because there, there were 50 people standing in it when he got there. And then he had that horrific three-putt at Chambers Bay from, what, 20 feet to yep. miss the playoff with Spieth and just came back and recovered from it. You know, two things that would have broken a lot of players. And, and moving the ball <clears> on the putting green. Uh, I think he was on which yeah. he won, yeah. yeah. At, at Oakland, Even to, at, to get through that. At Oakland, yeah. which was ridiculous. So mm. he certainly brushes off things that would seriously Sorry. derail He's a cyborg. players who think uh, about uh, golf in a different fashion. I'm not sure he was going to be a brain surgeon if he wasn't a golfer. Actually. Yeah, you know, but, but, I don't think it's a secret that he's not that he's not going to win no. any Mensa awards. But no, but yeah. <laughs> but he's great to watch. You know, the way oh, he gets awesome. down through the ball, the power he gets through the ball is unbelievable. Yeah, uh, he's my tip. I mean, that that was unbelievable. Stuart Appleby finished tied twelfth yeah, in that, that event, which a was bit, was a, yeah. a big. You yeah, know, Cam a big Percy result. had a good finish, top twenty five, yeah. reckon. Cam did so. They were the leading Australians. It's it's great. And there's a, well, we'll get to another Australian who. You have not seen anywhere near a leaderboard for the last 15 years, I don't reckon, when we get to the Asian tour through our web, through our tour kind of round up. But it's great to see. It takes a fair bit of um, commitment to the craft, doesn't it, when you see guys like Appleby who could – maybe he's got – view. his view his view is to – Well, he's lost his status, so he, he must it. have either got uh, – I was talking to Clates about this before we started, but – he must have either got a, a sponsor's invite or, or Clates thought he might have got in on a past champion. He would have got a the, the past champions category that when the fields are particularly, I don't want to say weak because there are no weak fields on the US Tour, but when it goes a long way down the list, at some point you hit the past champions category, which I assume is how he got into that tournament. So how would he, would, would he have just got an, an email out of the blue? Or like how, how does, well, when how your number just comes up. Because he, he wouldn't have been thinking I'm going to be playing this week. Would know, he, management I mean, would have done it, I imagine. Uh, well, no. I assume he would. Every player would enter, like Stuart would enter every tournament oh, at the start right. of the yeah. start of the week. And the tour would say you're the seventy fifth reserve this week, so you know you're not going to get. It. But a week out, they might have said you're third reserve and you're in and you play. Well, so waitlisting for Saturday for when the. Well, he's clearly warming up for a, a full stint at the senior tour, you know, champions tour. When he's what is he forty six? You make some money on that, won't he? He still works pretty hard, doesn't he, yeah. Stewie? Like that's his one back's been no good. His back's, yeah, his yeah, back's been right a big problem. Okay, no, yeah. that's really what's what's sort of yeah, down, his back's been you know, terrible. Down, yeah. Railroaded him. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't the most interesting tournament of the week, though. Um, what happened over in Europe was pretty fascinating. The Austrian Open. I think they changed the name of it to the Shot Clock Masters. Did you? How much of this did you take in, and what did you think of it? I watched enough of it to know what the concept was. I didn't watch that much of it, but I, but. For those who didn't see it, they were you know, the first to play had 50 seconds and there was a referee with every group with a golf buggy with a, with a clock on it. And as soon as it was your turn to play, they pressed the button and you had 50 seconds to hit. The second and third guys in the group had 40 seconds and it highlighted how slow play on the tour is now because they knocked half an hour off their times. Yeah, which is fantastic. Didn't and the, seem the to response affect has been really good. Oh, players loved it. Mm. Didn't seem to affect the quality of play at all. There's still... A hell of a lot of good shots to play. There were four, four penalty under, shots for the week. There's 16 under wins. It's not as if you know the 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 scoring has been affected because of it. Is this something that we'll see more of? I don't know whether you can bring it in everywhere. I, I doubt that that's going to happen. But you know, who knows? Well, if they're getting around in I mean, 30, 35, 40 minutes quicker, is, is golf the only sport where there's not a shot clock? Tennis has one. AFL has one. Yeah. Basketball has one. Mm. Would you? I mean, Blakey's a bit reticent to accept the fact that. I'm could not you sure see that, this? Given that the players own the tours, I'm not sure they're going to accept it. But they'll accept. They've obviously accepted it for this week. But are they going to accept it for every week, Clates? Uh, that they, that's a long shot. I doubt it. Yeah. Mm. But it's. I mean, I, I think slow play is an overrated problem. I think it's a. But it's Do you a, really? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Why? Why? Well, five and a half hour rounds. Five think, hours. Well, that's a bit round. long, but. 
I mean, the problem with slow players. See Patrick Cantlay last week. Well, he's got the. I think he's got the. I can't take the club back to Zeke. Okay, right. Yeah, looked at the other week. Yeah, I've had that. It's no good. It's not no. fun. Sergio had it. Um, you know, I think s- turning four and a half hour, hour rounds into five hour rounds is not that big of a deal to me. That, you know, that, that's what two minutes extra. A whole, I, that's not. I mean, where I it was brought home to me one day. I was playing with a friend of mine. We played at St Andrews Beach as a two ball on a Saturday, and we got stuck behind three lots of four. And we were we always playing two and a half hours. And it, because we had nothing else to do, we sort of ground it through and the ninth doesn't go back to the clubhouse. So it took us five hours to play something that would have taken, a two, taken us two and a half hours. So two and, a, two and a half hours on a normal round is not acceptable. But 20 minutes or half an hour onto a four and a half hour round, is, it doesn't bother me at all. Yeah. But but other people it does. So I'm, I'm very prepared, open to the fact that it bothers other people. And clearly the quicker golf is played, the better. But I don't think it's a race. And, you know, um, where I think it's important is that golf doesn't evolve from being a three-hour round or a three-hour 15 round, which it was 70 years ago, into a four-hour four round when Jack Nicholson and Carrie Middlecoff were Middlecoff first and Nicholson were the first terribly slow players. So golf became a four, four-and-a-half-hour round. It's now devolved into a five-hour round. You, you, clearly, you don't want it. The, the next step is six hours. What becomes ex- the accepted norm? It become, yeah, becomes, yeah, yeah. and of course, a big part of the issue, going back to my pet beef, is the ball goes too fast. So the courses are getting way too long to allow for the ball. So you play the open at St Andrews, on the old, on the old course, the original course, you, you would step off pretty much every green onto the tee. Mm. Now at 14 of the 18 holes at St Andrews, there's a 60 yard walk back, back to the, the tee. right yeah, to the yeah, to yeah. the tees they've had to build because the ball goes too far. Yeah. Plus, so that adds. Plus, every par five is reachable, easily yeah, reachable yeah, for, yeah. for every player. So they're wait, yeah, waiting for yeah. the green to clear. Well, there are there are only two par fives in that golf course, mm, but yeah. you know, so so that adds a truckload of time, just the extra walking. So it's a bigger issue of the ball, how long it's taking to play, how much land the the game is using, how much extra water. You know, that's a much bigger discussion. But golf pros taking four hours, four five. Four hours forty-five versus no, that's four and a half that's hours. Okay. Is, yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't yeah. bother me that no, much. So they were four yeah. hours fifteen in Austria, average for the first three rounds when they played in threes, and uh, on the last round when they played two balls, uh, they were three hours twenty-six. That's average. amazing. Yeah. But that's inc- that's great. You know, it's... and only four players got penalised yep. uh, for being too slow. And I think Clayton said to me before that one of them was on the putting green. Was on the putting green. There's yeah. a famous story about talking about how quick golf used to be. Nineteen twenty-six U.S. Uh, British Open at Letham, Jones, Bobby Jones playing with Al Waltrus. They teed off at 9.15 and they teed off at 1.15 for their second round. 36 holes the last day on a Friday because the club pros had to get back to the clubs on Saturdays to work. So Jones and Waltrus <laughs> teed off at 9.15 and 1.15 and in between their rounds walked back to the hotel for lunch and walked back to the golf course. Four hours. I mean, so that's, that's how great. quick golf used to be. That's great. So, so Sue O played well. Andy. She played well again. LPGA Tour. Yep. Finished uh, tied fifth, 12 under in a three-round event. Pretty handy. Clates, you've caddied for Sue before. You've mentored her. Uh, yeah. what, what's been the turnaround? Is it just the new clubs, which we mentioned last week? I actually mentioned, I'm not sure whether you heard it, but I mentioned that she's uh, not working with Cameron McCormick anymore. So she's made some changes and it's it's worked for her, you know. Well, she's made Three significant changes, all in all in the space of a fortnight. She was travelling with her dad, who's a great guy, but that dynamic never particularly worked that well. And she sent dad home, back to Melbourne, go back to Melbourne, live with mum and my sister and my brother, and I'll let look me, after myself. Me my which job. is a 22-year-old kid, be cool. you know, kind of wow. asserting some independence. Yeah. She's got a licence now. She's got an apartment. She's saying, dad, go home. I can, deal, I can deal with this on my own. So that was a big change for her. She stopped working with Cameron, which was what it was and cutting for her in the Vic Open she was playing what I thought a terrible set of clubs for her after the first round her caddy emailed me and said what do you see I said the club she's using are terrible she had graphite shafts strong lofts she had a 20 she had unbelievably a 23 degree 5 iron which for those who don't know what a, my 5 iron when I played was 30 degrees and she couldn't get the ball in the air and I said Duncan she can't get the ball in the air he said that's exactly what I see so, but I've still got the text on my phone. I'll show it to her one day. I said, okay, l- let's give ourselves three months to get those clubs out of the bag. 
And almost to the day, three months, she played horribly. She almost made no money. She made $17,000. And most of that had come from the two non-cut events in Asia. She missed four cuts. Right? We spoke about it. I said, look, between you and me, I think your clubs, the clubs you're using are terrible. So that, that you, you know, Duncan, we, we've spoken about it. And what I do, I, she, what should I do? I, well, get a set of clubs with steel shafts in them for a start. Was she in? A, she was in contract to. No, she had, no, no, which was a lucky thing. She was fortunately she had no deal with anybody. Okay. So she asked me what pings were like. I said, ping are great clubs. She said, well, I can get a set of ping clubs here by Tuesday. This was it. This was Saturday, and in, in, she'd missed the cut in LA, the Wiltshire. So, so she said, well, Ping can get me a set of clubs here by Tuesday. I said, get a set of Pings with steel shafts in them. She'd never hit a Ping club in her life. So the previous four tournaments, she was, I think, no, for the seven tournaments until San Francisco, she was 51 over par and she'd made $17,000. In the six tournaments since, she's 32 under par and made 220000 <laughs> oh, So she should be, rather than Ping paying her, she should be sending Ping a very nice thank you note for oh. and, so, a little, and, and, a know, little, and a little stipend coming your way. I would have thought, but anyway, no, no, no but not. Well, but you can shout us know, lunch. I, I think it? you know some, some you know a couple of changes off the course, changing clubs, and, and Duncan, a great caddy, who you know we both said to her, just play golf. Stop stressing out about your swing. About just go and play golf. So, so with because the cam- she's a she's a tremendous. She plays golf. I mean, going back to the sports psychology thing, I mean, they, someone suggested she go and see a sports psychologist. I mean, so I said, you're the last person who needs a sports psychologist. If you've got, you've got, I mean, I caddy for her. I'm embarrassed at what an idiot I was on the golf course and how badly I behaved and what a complete dick I was. Because every time I look at her and something bad happens, I remember back to how I would react uh-huh, in the well, same situation. Uh, uh, uh. And she just goes Jesus, on and sorry. never, I'm going... You were such a dick when you played. I mean, what are you saying? You don't need a sports. The last thing you need is a sports psychologist. You really. So she's, you know, she's playing better, which is good. She's a long way behind Minji and a way behind Aria Jutanagan, who's the, you know, the, yeah. and you know the best players in the world. But, but she's made a big step the last six weeks. She's that far behind them? No, miles behind. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, no, she she's thirty eighth on the main list on the LPGA tour. So she's moved into the the bottom echelon of the top third of players. Feels like she's about eighteen holes behind those girls. Like she's ranked eighty in the world. They're, she, they're, yeah, they're but, four, I mean, but the world four. rankings are kind of. Mm. I, I I pay much more attention to the main list on the LPJ tour because there there are players who play exclusively in Korea and Japan who earn a lot of points playing in Korea and Japan, yeah. which is the US tour, which is the what, who was the guy who threw the Grace and Murray. You know, it's the Grace and Murray argument a little bit, but. I put much more store on where she is on the May list in, on the LPJ tour because that's where the best players are playing. But she's better than what she's shown us so far, isn't she? I, I think the way she's played the last six weeks is, is what she's yeah. capable of. So the, for the, for those who haven't noticed, the, she had three good the first three weeks with Ping. She was you know eighteenth, twenty fifth, and seven whatever seventh. Then she was fourth in mm. three weeks ago. Tied for second at the US Open after two days. Shot a bad third day, finished 17th, but a $5 million tournament. So huge to play well there. And then fifth last week. So, so she's, you know, she's played six really good weeks. And the levels of, is she one of those people just needs that kind of element of self-belief? Is she is that, well, is that the stuff that she well, needs? Well, I think everyone needs to see some validation that they're yeah. a good player. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't think she, I mean, I dislike the word confidence. I think it's the most, one of the most overrated mm. concepts in sport. I think, you know, competence is much more important than confidence. And, uh, you know, and I think she's, the golf she's played the last six weeks has shown that she, she's played some very competent golf. And the, and the more competent golf she plays, the more that kind of word confidence jumps in. But she's just been playing competent golf, which is important. So she's flying. Um, Ty, this is one I wanted to get to before when we were talking about uh, Stewie Appleby. No one's talking about the Th- Thailand Open. Um, five ties. Finish one, two, three, four, five. Um, Chap Chai Nirat, who I think I declared about 15 years ago was going to be the best player on the earth. Uh, I saw him shoot like 63 in the final round of the Myanmar Open or something when I was like, it doesn't matter. But he's it's never funny won. how that can happen. I played a pro am with David Branston once and I said, this guy's going to win everything. Oh, so you know, I, I, the best ball striker I've ever seen, Chap yeah. Chai Nirat, and he's never gone anywhere. Yeah. But anyway, he finished fifth. Finishing sixth. Was Scotty Henner David Gleeson? 
Now, there's the name. David Gleeson has been missing cuts in fields that he's been getting into routinely for the last decade. And sticking at it, I don't know where he lives. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know whether he's still got the curly hair. I don't know what he's doing. Taiwan, I think. Maybe if, I isn't that amazing? Married, he married someone an Asian, I think, and maybe he got divorced. And I think, you know, I think he had a little problem with alcohol a little bit. I okay. know oh, well, it's good. I'm not sure that's no, 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 a secret, yeah, but right, okay. yeah. or not. But um, <laughs> he was a tremendous player. We need to. I mean, people talk, say that about him. He won the Australian Amateur. Yeah, Look, I don't know. Twenty years ago, he's forty now. Yeah. I don't. I so haven't not, really followed him that much. Yeah, I've been just. Mm. Well, he just, just I, he just disappeared, yeah. you know. Yeah. And he bobs up every now and again. He gets into a field like once. Every, I'm going to say once every six weeks. You see him mm. in a in an Asian tour event, and he shoots seventy eight, seventy six, and misses the cut by plenty. And it, the number of cuts he's made in the last five years, you could literally count on one hand. In fact, his name. I was up at Royal Queensland last week because he played there, and Chris Gibson, the pro there, teaches him, and his name came up last week. We were, I don't know, it came up out of the blue. And he, I said, what's he up to? He said, well, he's playing again. And so I said, what was his problem? He said, alcohol. Mm. Uh, so, but he was, he's a terrific player. Yeah, yeah it was just yeah. bizarre. It was bizarre that, I don't want to say his career went nowhere because he you know, he played well in Asia. But, you know, why didn't he turn into Cameron Smith? I mean, it was Cameron right. Smith a yeah, no, better well, player than David Gleeson? Not, not, certainly not from the outside, he wasn't. No, well, watch this space. Who knows? This might be at 40, and it's never too late, is it? I mean, well, 40s, you know. Kel Nagel played his. This is a pretty, pretty much. Kel, there was a. Someone posted a thing about Kel Nagel on Twitter this morning. People might think I live on in the Twitter the universe. The Nagel swing. It was a swing. Yeah, I saw it, yeah. Great swing. Beautiful. Uh, Kel was a great player, a wonderful player. He won the Open Championship in 1960 at 40, and it was the third major championship he'd ever played in. <laughs> is How that amazing right? is That's that? Incredible. Wow. Um, are we just are we keeping an eye on Curtis Luck at the moment? I, 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 whenever I see these guys yeah. who are hacking around the web dot com, who are clearly too good, I always think about it. it's the worst place to be. I, you've said it many, many. He had times. a better week last week. Yeah, he did. It's a graveyard that place. Yeah. Finished tied thirty three though, Blakey. He still yeah. didn't. You know, he had that bat seventy three in the needs final to make round. It, yeah, he's he's sixty six on the money list as far as like, maybe needs to, on, be in, needs to be top twenty five. So we've got two in the top twenty five there. Cam Davis and Ruin Gibson are yeah. inside the twenty five at the moment, mm. but it. I, yeah, if, he needs to. Play. He's got ten weeks to go. I think ten or thirteen. Ten weeks to go. So, I mean, I caved for him in the Open, Australian Open last year. Tremendous player. I, 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 I know if he. Well, I don't know. I, he's told me he, if he misses here, he'll go to the Tour School in Europe, which I think is a much better place right. for him to be playing than. Oh, that's than, interesting. Than, than the yeah. web.com to it. Right. Well, Ruffles, Ryan Ruffles is the other one who's you know gone gone missing a little bit. There's some some talented young players out there, but obviously, Clates, it's it's very hard. I mean. Uh, Sue O was in the same position two years ago. I remember she went over to the Symmetra tour and just didn't yeah, fire played, a shot. It she played horribly. Yeah, yeah that was it. That was for And Ryan Ruffles is just, you know, he turned yeah. pro very young and he he just isn't really uh, I mean, people found are, his way yet. People, I, you know, I, well, I, I spoke to Susie O'Donnell. and I said, I'll tell you what the best thing about you playing well is. There hasn't been one person has come up to me at Metro in the last month and said, what's wrong with Sue O? <laughs> you know, and it's just, you know, it's the same, <laughs> what's wrong with Ryan Ruffles? I, I said to someone that I said, He's 20 years old. I said, you know, barely were any of my generation good enough to be playing in a senior state team at 20. Yes. Yeah. You know, so it's, he's young. The average age of a player who gets his full-time playing privileges on the USPJ Tour is 27. Yeah. He's got plenty of time. I mean, people, you know, he, he, fight, he went off like a firecracker when he was a 15-year-old. He played, finished third in the Vic Open and played some terrific golf in the Australian Open a couple of years in a row. But... You know, it's, a, it's a long, grinding slope. And there are lots of guys who are who are very good at golf now. Mm. Uh, bits and pieces, the housework that we uh, generally need to get through at the end. Remind listeners, that if you are a regular listener but you haven't become a subscriber, you can do that uh, through your Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts from. I know you've got a few other bits and pieces for me, Gazelle, that we need to know. Yeah, and we just need to remind people this fantastic competition that Golf Australia's running called the Play Nine competition. You'll get, you can see it if you want some details on it. It's on the Golf Australia website, golf.org.au backslash play nine. But this is the second 
consecutive year that they've done it. They're offering up 24 lucky golfers from around the country. They actually get to play nine holes at the Lakes, which is the venue of the Australian Open, on day three of the Open in November this year. Uh, You get to play on the course as it's set up. Uh, The winners will travel to Sydney on Friday, 16 November, stay for two nights, receive a gift pack, attend the Champions Cocktail Function, uh, this is all being done through the clubs and, and golf facilities around the country. So find out from your golf club what's going on. They should have posters up on the wall and uh, get around it because it, it, what a great prize. Sensational prize. Mm. Being able to play the same week that the tournament's I've set got a, up. I've got a five-star cool. review I want to hear. Well. I, I need to hear this week. because it Yeah, I was instructed to read this one out from yeah. Malibu's Mob. Uh, love listening to you guys. Especially love it when Mike Clayton is on as he has such a different view on many things. It's fantastic the interviews you have uh, with the players, especially the ones with the up and comers, like the one you had just had with Lucas Herbert. Keep up the good work from Mark in Perth. And it's interesting you, that Mark. he mentions. Thanks for the five star. Interesting he mentions Lucas Herbert because he's one of the young blokes who has been locking horns with you on the backstopping and uh, slash pace of play issue for quite some time. Oh, that's right. He had a whack at me. The back, well, it was a backstopping. Was it backstopping on the ball as well? The other, uh, even though all of them. No, no, oh. no, no, no. He's, he thinks no. you're one of the old blokes. Well, we love him, but he thinks you're one of the old. My, my question, my, always, my was who do you think knows more about golf, Curtis Strange or Lucas Herbert? Would be my <laughs> question. And Lee Westwood and Luke Donald. Are we up to general business Blair. yet, Andy? Well, that was general business. What else I've got you one, one more thing. I just yep. wanted to send out some love and uh, respect to the Peter Thompson and his family. Peter uh, hasn't been well lately. He was actually hospitalised a couple of weeks ago. He's back at home now, as I understand it. Mike, you might even know a little bit more, but he's he hasn't been well. So just Are you jiggling just your some... change around? Sorry, no. as you're doing this? Keep yeah, going. Yeah. I haven't got much. So. No, keep going. Uh, so, yeah, just some love to the Thompson family and hope he's... Getting better. Here, here. 88 Absolutely. years of age, Peter. And his partner, Ross Perrett, who had a stroke a month ago in his golf course design business. So Ross is, I think, doing okay, but not great, obviously. Thoughts but, with the pair yeah, of them, so obviously. The, 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 yeah. um, can you just have a quieter week this week? Just maybe get off Twitter for yeah, a week? Yeah, or, I'm going to go home and write my column for um, for Golf Australia on the, the my preview of Shinnecock. And always a Great week playing on a great golf course. Can't so wait. It'll Can't be, wait. be terrific. We'll awesome. Spending some Looking forward to it, Andy. Many, many hours in the wee small ones uh, awake watching the golf. Thanks for tuning in, folks. This has been Inside the Ropes. We'll be back again next week to do it all again.